Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Joy Project. I'm Krista Avampato, your host. It's been an especially challenging few weeks around the U.S. and around the world. Honestly, I was sad and angry for most of it. Making this podcast and seeking out joy is one of the things that's helping me process my emotions and turn them into motivation and action. It's my great hope that this podcast is helping you too and that it will continue to help you. Helping you find more joy is the whole reason I'm doing this project. And I hope you're taking care of yourselves and those you love. We have a lot of work to do, and this world needs all of us at our best. Finding and making joy is a part of our self-care and part of how we care for others. And in that spirit, something that brings a lot of us joy is getting out of our homes and routines and into the world. If you're eager to get back out there on the open road and travel, this episode's for you. Memorial Day marks the start of the summer travel season. Now with prices and demand high and the COVID-19 virus still circulating with shifting travel rules, travel requires more planning than ever before. Dr. Edith Gonzalez, an anthropologist, professor, expert travel planner, is here to help us with tips, ideas, and experiences to make our travel easier and more joyful. Edith is a very dear friend of mine, someone who was an enormous support to me as I fought and beat cancer and the first person who encouraged me to pursue my PhD in environmental sustainability at my dream university. Please join me in giving Edith a very warm welcome. Edith, welcome to Joy Project. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Can you tell us where you are joining us from today? I am joining you from the very sunny Buffalo, New York. Very cold and sunny Buffalo, New York. Love it. And what do you do in Buffalo? I am an assistant professor of archaeology at the University at Buffalo. I'm going to start this conversation the way that I always start our conversations by asking you, what brings you joy? You know, I have a secret love of spreadsheets, but besides that, what brings me joy is travel, but it's all the stuff that happens prior to that in the planning of the travel that gets me really happy. Yes. And I think that spreadsheets, unsung heroes in our lives. I love a good spreadsheet, color-coded. I love charts made from spreadsheets. I love data (laughs) categorized with really lovely headings. I like to check things off on spreadsheets. There's no end to the joy that I get from spreadsheets. So I, I totally get it. Can you tell us a little bit about your travel planning process? So what does it look like? You have a vacation coming up or you've got a block of time and you're going to do some traveling. What's the first thing you do? Well, it depends if I'm traveling for work or if I'm traveling for pleasure. If I'm traveling for work, there are a lot of set parameters of things that I have to do. So usually the first thing that I do is block out a schedule of the things I know that I have to do for work. So any known meetings, events, I look at, well, where will I be? And I'm also spreadsheets, maps are the other like serious (laughs) artifact that brings me joy in this process. I'll break out some maps and figure out where I am. And then from their plan, where will I stay in relation to where I have to be? And then it goes into this deep territory of my other love, which is fashion to figure out what am I going to wear while I'm there? I love to pack. I'm very good at packing. I like to pack as light as possible. I like everything to have double duty, but sometimes when I travel for work, I have multiple things that I need to do. Some of them include like fundraising events. It might include meetings, but also like working in a dusty archive or in a lab. And then I figure out the weather and everything of where I'm going to be. So I, do I need coats? Do I need jackets? And then working my way down to items for each event and then accessories. I don't do the cube packing because that's not flexible enough for me. I have this specific clear plastic quart size zipper bag for toiletries that I really, really love. And it's kind of always set to go. I have separate, I have the one that I would take for a longer trip. And then I have quart Ziploc bags for a weekender and whatever. It's all in this journal. So it's written down paper, pen. I do have a bullet journal and it has page inserts for every two months. There's a little sheet that is just for planning what to pack. Obviously, as an anthropologist, you're very into the archive, very into the artifact that's left behind. Hundreds of years from now, somebody will take a look at these journals and they will be like, look at everything that Dr. Edith Gonzalez was packing. I had to travel (laughs) to England and I was, and I got a fellowship and I was going to be there for a few months. That was a super fun trip to plan because I was going to be 
staying mostly in London, but I had to go to Oxford too, and having to figure out what neighborhood I wanted to live in, what things were important to me, what was open, what would I be able to do? Do you think of them in some way as diary entries? Like, do you go back and look at them and revisit? Oh yes. I remember that trip. And like, by looking at these lists and these maps, does it sort of let you relive the trip? It does. It also lets me relive some of the planning. And there is like a spectrum of how people like to travel. And I think on one end of the spectrum are these people who like throw a dart at a place on a map and just grab their backpack and go with no, no, no plan with a one-way ticket. How do you feel about that kind of travel? I have done that, except that I still pack very carefully. (laughs) Other side of that are people who love to plan. They plan it all out. They schedule it, like schedule it hard and then get upset if you don't follow the schedule. I am not that person. Oh, interesting. So you make the plans, but you also leave flexibility, room for flexibility in the plans. I also work in government, work a lot with government regulations in things, COVID testing sites, a doctor's office. You have to plan for the, those things in the time of COVID. So that is included with all my reservations and contacts numbers. I knew that I wanted to take a cruise on the canal boats that are in the shipping canals of uh, England. And I found the group that runs those. I found when I looked for my Airbnb, I love Google Maps because you can do the street view and walk through so that I could plan the walk to see how long would it really take me to get to my destination at the uh, Bodleian Library. I knew that I wanted to go to the Globe Theater, so I booked tickets ahead of time. And then there are these old places that I really wanted to go and check out, mostly that are old pubs. I like historic buildings. So I'm looking at the old buildings and and when there's something to go see. So I put them all on here and put an approximate date of when I wanted to do them, but I didn't do them on those dates except for the theater tickets, which, you know, had no choice. So you've got clothes, toiletries, gadgets, and research supplies. And so this is very clearly for a work trip, but then also doing some fun things mixed in as well. The joy that comes from that, is it just the looking forward to the trip? Is there a sense of security that you get in having the plans? When I was in my 20s, I could easily throw a dart at a map and go do something. I am a very practiced traveler. I mean, I think about to the, say, three or four years before COVID happened, I was traveling a week or two out of every month. And I love going to a place I've never been before and the exploration that goes along with that. Becoming a mom changed how I had to plan to travel. I've dragged my poor kid all over the world since he was three months old. And in doing that, I needed to have a packing list where prior I'd be like, oh, I'll just have some skinny jeans and a pretty dress and some sandals and flip flops and I'll, you know, wing it, doesn't matter. But when you're traveling with a baby, all of a sudden you have to know if you can get the things that you need for that kid um, along the way. And so my planning got more practical practical and less like, oh, I'd love to see what can we do there. And also because my son's father is the kind of traveler that does not think for a moment about the trip until they're on the trip, that they get no pleasure from the anticipation of it. For a long time, I felt like, okay, if I leave it up to him, like, will we have the stuff for the kid when we get arrived? And his philosophy has always been like, if we don't have it, when we get there, we can always buy it. Your son is now in college. And do you feel like your travel planning could change, will change, might change? Or do you feel like now you've had so many years of this kind of planning, it's now ingrained in you? I didn't realize how much I loved it until I had to do it. And I got such a sense of satisfaction. My suitcase is completely packed a week before I leave. And then I can relax and just have that last week of just anticipating all the fun I'm going to have. I love when my travel documents are in the order I need them in the folder. And this became even more important traveling during COVID when I had to travel for work. And all of a sudden it was like every kind of form you needed to be able to get, even just pass through any gate. And you were traveling internationally during COVID. So then you had to be conscious of not just U.S. rules, New York rules, but where am I going and what are their rules? And they were vastly 
different than our rules were. And then coming back, being able to get back into the country. And that was a constantly shifting landscape of what the requirement was to get back into New York. I felt like I like, I figured some stuff out and it was really fun. I think the best trip I ever planned to go on with my family was with my son and his dad and his stepmom, because me and his stepmom are the same in this, that we really love <laughs> to. So she and I, we planned a trip to Venice together, which is one of my favorite places to visit and I will go back there anytime anybody want anybody want to go to Venice like so we decided we we're gonna go she and I signed up for Duolingo and we would do in our Italian lessons you know four months out we're working on our Italian she was much better at it than I was we would send each other emails about we would encounter something interest in Venice and we would be emailing each other this thing so we're adding it to this itinerary of all the stuff we wanted to see while we were there my son and his dad both are the opposite of this. So when we arrived there, all of a sudden I have a teenager who's like, I don't know what I want to do. I'm like, did you not in the six months we've known we're going, did you not like think maybe look it up once? I used to go to Barnes and Noble to the travel section and pick up a let's go guide for student travelers and sit there and look through it and, you know, copy stuff down because I was too poor to actually buy the guide. So I'd write down a couple of things and there's something about having a guidebook that's really kind of nice. Uh, and, and there's something really kind of charming and fun about it. It's a curated experience, right? Like people who write travel guides have been there. They've been to all these hotels. They've been to all these restaurants. Whereas when you're on Google, you're really in some ways you're having to on the fly sift through a lot of stuff on your own, whereas you can just have this paper guide that you can mark up. I always have a notebook. You know this about me. I always have a notebook and I will start a file. And sometimes it's a paper file, an actual file folder in my file cabinet. And sometimes it, or a notebook that is just for the trip. And sometimes it'll be um, a digital file and I'll just start to drop things in there, links to uh, exhibits or museums that I know I want to see. And uh, that becomes a spreadsheet because, you know, I work in museums, in the museum uh, field. And so I will frequently, if I'm someplace, I want to check out the competition. No, I want to check out and see what people are doing, what's new and exciting in the museum field with exhibits. So I want to go and check that stuff out. And I will also, I love food and I always want to find out what is the specialty of that place and then find out where to go to get that specialty of that place. And sometimes I want to do a taste test. I jokingly say I kidnapped my son, but it was one year in spring break. I picked him up from his dad's house in Austin, Texas in the kind of the middle of the nights I get in the car and drove to New Orleans as a surprise. He had so much fun. We just went for a couple of days, but when he woke up, because he was sleeping in the car, when he woke up, take your phone out. We're going to New Orleans, pick three things you want to do. Cause that's the time ahead of the trip. He's is when he can focus and plan, but I'm forcing him to plan something. Then next year he said, Hey, can we do that again and bring a friend? So he had this friend who was going with him. My son is a very adventurous eater and food. He likes all kinds of food. His friend was not. And so we decided, well, how can we have fun with food in New Orleans with somebody who's not an adventurous eater? And we decided to choose a food specialty of New Orleans that we knew this person would actually eat. And then we decided to do a taste test of the three places best known for this. And then everybody wrote reviews. That's so fun. In New Orleans, what food did you pick? Roast beef po'boys. Did you agree on which one was the best or did you all have different opinions? We agreed which one was the best, but we had to, I, and I, you know, cause I am a scientist. We had to have categories by which these were judged. We had to judge bread, gravy, and any other topping size, saltiness. Like there was a bunch of criteria. There was a spreadsheet. Let's just say there was a checklist. We had a lot of fun. I've been like, New Orleans is another city that I really love. So I actually knew where to go to to do these things, but I did have my son find another place we could add to the list because I had two that I really liked. So he had to find another one. My son and I went to Lisbon, Portugal. That was the last big trip before COVID that my son and I made ahead of time. I was like, just figure out what the food is. I'll figure out where to go if you figure out what the food is. So we did that. It was really fun. And we are now currently planning a trip to Cuba. You've been to Cuba before. No, never, never. 
no, I'm dying to go. I have been to Cuba and I love it. I went in that very narrow window during the Obama administration when it, when everybody could go or anybody could go if they were, you know, applied for this special visa. It remains one of the most enlightening trips I have. I'm looking around my apartment because I have some art that I bought there. That was amazing. And it's just, I can just see you in Cuba, just absorbing all of it. Cause it's just, it's so beautiful. Very tough trip to plan for though, because it's very tough to get information about what's going on in Cuba. It's very, it's very tough to know what's open. You really have to rely on recommendations. You ask the person at the hotel, you, uh, you go to a restaurant that you like and you ask them where they would go. You know, it's very, it's sort of like a, like a choose your own adventure, depending on, you know, who you meet, which is very exciting. Because the window for that has closed. The only reason that I'm able to go is I'm going on an academic visa for a conference. We're not going to be in Havana. We're going to be in a, in a, uh, another city. And I asked my son if he wanted to go because he's a student, he can come with me on a student visa. So on an, also on an academic visa. So we're really excited. We'll be there for two weeks. And then I'm going to be having to go do continue research elsewhere for the rest of the summer. I don't know where I'm going yet, which for me is a little stressful. <laughs> it is. I'm waiting to find out if I got this Fulbright grant. If I get the Fulbright grant, then I know that I'll be in England for six months next year. But if I don't get the Fulbright grant, then I'll have to go to England this summer. So like, it's that, that's, so it's happy reasons for pause on this, but my son has announced that he's coming with me wherever I go. That is so exciting. I love it. And I know he's like your adventure partner and he's like your favorite person to travel with. So I love that you're going to get to do that with him and you're instilling, you know, all these memories and good planning, joyful practices. <laughs> We're working on packing. We're working on packing. He's terrible. He always forgets something, but he's his father's son. So his attitude is we'll figure it out when we get there. I'll just buy it when we get there. Edith, thank you so much for joining us on the Joy Project. I love that you find this joy in travel planning. I'm hoping that many more of us will have the opportunity to do travel planning in 2022 than we've done, you know, in more recent times. And I'm so excited to, to share your artifacts with listeners and they can see the beauty of these spreadsheets, but thank you so, so much for joining us. I hope that you will come back when you get back from Cuba, when you get back from your trips over the UK and, and, and share some more joy with us. Absolutely. Anytime. My pleasure. I'm so grateful to Edith for her time, her friendship, and her wonderful advice on how to plan our travels during these challenging times. The transcript for this episode, along with pictures of Edith's travel planning documents are on our website, kristaavampato.com slash joy project. At the end of every episode, I share something that brought me joy this week related to the episode topic. This week, I want to tell you about the wonderful series Somebody Feed Phil, which is back on Netflix for its fifth season with delicious food travels to Oaxaca, Maine, Helsinki, Portland, Oregon, and Madrid. Phil, his crew, including his brother Richard, his guides and guests will inspire you to get out into the world, eat delicious food, make friends, and enjoy all the richness that life has to offer. Phil's parents were a wonderful part of the show, and unfortunately, they've both passed on. To honor the jokes his dad, Max, used to tell on the show, he has comedians tell jokes that Max would have loved. It's an endearing series filled with joy, and I'm so grateful to Phil and everyone involved for making the show. In one of the episodes, Phil recommends the free app, Word of Mouth, which I had never heard of before. It's an independent restaurant guide powered by a global community of culinary experts. It's made for passionate foodies who want to discover the tastiest parts of the world, and it's delightful. So on your trip, I hope that you will use the Word of Mouth app and enjoy all of the culinary delights that this world has to offer. Thanks so much for joining me here on The Joy Project. I make this podcast for you. I hope it brought you some joy. It certainly brought me some joy. We all need a respite in this difficult world, and I hope this podcast is a way that you are finding some peace and some happiness and some joy so that we can recharge and get back out there in the world to do the work that we need to do. Thank you so much for joining me. You can check out another episode of Joyful News, which also drops today, the same day as this episode with Dr. Edith Gonzalez. It is a collection of stories over the past two weeks of joyful news that I have found from all over the world. I hope it's something that you love. I hope that you'll check it out. And I'll be back with another interview episode in two weeks on Tuesday, June 14th. Please take care of yourselves. Please take care of each other. And I'll talk to you soon. I hope you go out there and find a lot of joy and tell me all about it. On Twitter at Krista NYC, on Instagram at Krista Rose NYC, and on our website, KristaAvampato.com slash joy project.